So I think muscle strengths are really important impairment to measure, and I pretty much measure it the first time I see any mm -hmm. patient, unless I'm really short on time. But um, our systematic review showed that people with FAI are reduced in their muscle strength across the board yeah, in all direction. muscles compared to controls. Yeah. But I think we can be a little bit more specific. Um, we've done some work that have, has shown that people who have hip pain, who have had hip surgery, have reduced strength in their hip adductors and extensors. Mm -hmm. And that's regardless of whether they're men and women and regardless of how bad their hip pathology was at surgery. Yeah. And that makes sense because your hip adductor, so your adductor magnus, for example, is a really strong extensor. So you would expect those two to be coupled together. Yeah. And it's certainly what we've found and we've put in, in like we've, one of our interventions has been adduction with a bit of hip extension as well, yeah. which seems to have really made a big difference with our hip pain. So yeah. I think clinically I would definitely support that. Yeah, I agree. And when we get to the um, exercise intervention part yeah. of the masterclass, we'll yeah. go through the adduction sort of strengthening mm -hmm. in a lot of detail. The other thing that we found was that women tended to, the hip abductors tended to be more impacted in women and mm -hmm. particularly women with pathology, which I think fits with what we see as women get older, yeah. that they do lose a lot of function in their hip abductors and you see it coexisting with um, gluteal tendinopathy and similar pathologies as well. And I think it's um, important to also think of the sport specificity around this. So with, I know with um, the research shown with soccer players that if you look at a ratio, their yeah. adductors are stronger than their abductors, yes. whereas normal population tend to be equal. Yeah. And then in the ballet population, we're the opposite. So their abductors are stronger than their adductors. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, thinking about what sort of sport they play, I think ice hockey is also another activity mm. that the abductors are stronger. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really, I agree. And I think that what we've um, also shown is that people who are stronger in their adductors and abductors tend to have um, better, less pain, better mm -hmm. quality of life as yeah. well. So really supports being able to, target. yeah, and be able to measure those things accurately. Yeah. So the way I tend to use strength um, assessment is that at the initial assessment, I measure all of the hip strength measures and not just because I, I think the number is really important, but I find for patients, it really aids their compliance Absolutely. and motivates them to... Yes to really um, do what you tell them to do. And then I also retest each session, but it's really only picking the key target. So I might only do one or two measures, mm -hmm. you know, for time reasons at each session. Great. Um, that's that's the way I tend to use a dynamometer. But mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's, if you're treating a lot of people with hip pain, having a dynamometer is a critical part of your clinical practice. So measuring abduction strength, um, I use a, a commander dynamometer that has the force plate there so that with this dynamometer you can do all of your testing um, one after the other without needing to stop and enter the results. So for abduction testing, I get the patient to hold onto the side of the bed to brace themselves and then um, resist and hold that resistance for around about five seconds, repeat it three times and then do the same on the other side. Great. Yeah. Do you have any other different ways you do it, Sue? Well, we've um, we did have the dyno, and but we've just been starting to use the Vold force oh, plate, great. So force frame, yes. so, which has been fantastic. And yeah. I think the dancers love to see the little graph, and it works out the yes. ratio for you very like that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we're gradually getting everyone through. One of the trick tricks for us is to try to encourage them to do their absolute max. Yeah. So especially when we're um, they're usually rushing between rehearsals. So that's where we struggle to get them to do a max um, in their busy schedule. Yeah. So um, we'll probably then maybe use the exercises and how many sets and reps and weight you can do yes. as our objective measure. Great, yeah. In that situation. Yeah. I then usually follow abduction strength with adduction because mm -hmm. it's all done in supine. So with adduction strength, similar position, you're in supine, the patient's bracing on the side of the bed. And then I tend to brace myself on the side of the bed here and um, then ask them to pull in as, as hard as they can. Same time frame, same yeah. number of repetitions as their hip um, abduction strength testing. So that's looking at isometric adduction strength. And then are you um, comparing left to right and what sort of percentage are you looking for to say that they've got a deficit? So absolutely comparing left and right. Mm -hmm. So ideally you would see a similarity um, left to right. As you mentioned before, the ratio between mm -hmm. the abductors and adductors is really important and yep. that needs to be specific to the mm -hmm. patient and, and their sport. And um, we don't really have published numbers on what normal is because it really mm -hmm. varies from 
um, between men and women, between tall people and short people mm -hmm. and the type of sport. But I do sort of have some ballpark figures that clinically I use um, that haven't been published, but having seen a lot of people clinically, I really like their adduction strength to be probably over 150 newtons to be confident mm -hmm. that those hip adductors are working, uh, you know, are strong enough to sort of cope with the demands yeah. of a fairly active life. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. And Do what you, about your abductor, abductors? Sim, they need so, to be similar. Yeah, because yeah. you've got the equal ratio. Yeah. So I tend to aim for an equal ratio uh -huh. generally, but then vary it depending on, like we were talking about before the sport, um, I think women probably need to be a little bit stronger in their abductors yes. than their adductors. But mm -hmm. so abdu abduction generally, uh, say between 150 and 200 mm -hmm. newtons, depending on if it's a man or a woman. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important with adduction to measure it eccentrically mm -hmm. as well. Um, one of the things that I find is that when you're working with athletes who have running and changing direction sport, that you might test their adduction strength isometrically and it might look great. They might have 200 newtons and it's equal to their abductors and you're really, really happy, mm -hmm. but they're still having groin pain. Mm -hmm. And um, when you measure their adduction strength eccentrically, you can often tease out those more high level deficits that you do need to address to return them to full yeah. function. So it's a little bit different, the testing position here in that the patient's inside lying and their top leg's bent up out of the way. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we hold it isometrically for three seconds and then you ask the patient to resist your force while you force them down to the bed. And so it's that final part of the test where they're using that eccentric adduction strength. And so really that, adduct, that eccentric adduction strength should be higher yep. than their isometric right. strength. Is there any um, concern about it being a bit pr more provocative? Yes. Would you time it a bit differently? Yes, absolutely. So that test is one that I would potentially not do on the initial assessment okay. when people come and they're sore. When we're getting to the later stages of their rehab mm -hmm. and their pain perhaps is only when they're doing that high level sport, mm -hmm. that's when I'll introduce that eccentric adduction test. And then as far as different modes of contraction, I guess the other thing that we look at is endurance. Yeah. So we might do a like a minute hold in that same sideline position and then see how many little rises they can do. And we expect them to do at least sort of about 30. Yeah, um, which is quite a lot. And compare it you know, between sides. So yeah, just bring that sort of endurance component into it as well. Do you um, look for pain when you're doing the endurance testing? Yeah, it's more for their capacity. So yeah. usually we keep them, they might be painful with an adductor tendinopathy, for example, if they're doing it in that inner range. Yeah. Um, but we're sort of measuring pain. We're not too worried if it's sort of a low score. Yeah. But um, it's certainly, yeah, more of the endurance capacity, the number that we're counting and the time under mm -hmm. tension. Hip flexion strengths are really, really important mm -hmm. one. And um, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. In, I tend to do it in the sitting position, whereas I know, Sue, you tend to do it um, in the um, in the supine position, mm -hmm. so here's the the supine position. Here is this sort of how you would test it yeah. in the supine? Yep. So, so really trying to support the limb. Yeah, just going as you know as high as you can in flexion, pain permitting, of course. Yep. And then just you know slowly bringing it on, so you really can just not get that sort of massive co-contraction of everything. Yeah. Um, I think you can really isolate it nicely there, and they can just relax and really make sure they're getting just pure hip flexion. Yeah, which is a little bit different to how I do it, um, which is in sitting. And one of the problems you have in sitting, and we can see it a little bit in this test, you can see how the patient's um, laterally flex flexing his trunk to try and stabilise. So it's really important that they have the capacity to sit up mm. tall and maintain um, a neutral trunk position. So maybe more down the track when you're in, you yeah. know, they've got a bit more control around the trunk, you know, probably yeah. that first one is you know the very early stages when they've got a very aggravated hip mm. yeah absolutely the other thing when you're doing this um, test in sitting is you have to be really careful that you let them lift their leg a little bit first before you apply the pressure because right. otherwise you tend to measuring how strong you can push them into the bed yep. rather than how much hip flexion strength they have but i think it's nice to have the two different mm, ways great. ways to measure it extension strength is a tricky one to measure. It's notoriously not reliable, but I must say I find that when you practice it a lot, you do actually get better at it. So the way I tend to measure extension strength is in prone, um, where the patient will bend their knee up to 90, and then you pop the, the force plate on their heel, and then you ask them to push up and you resist them pushing up into the um, up towards the ceiling. What do you think makes it unreliable? Is it just that 
the strength you need to do it? I or? think it's how much I think it's how much force the tester applies. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because what you tend to do is you again you can tend to force them down into the bed. Right. And um, the other thing too is if you have a really really strong athlete, you might find it really hard to actually match their resistance. Mm -hmm. And they can if if you're a smaller tester, they can actually lift you up. Okay. And they've got a lot of strength, which suggests that they don't have a hip extension <laughs> def strength deficit. Sure. But um, yeah, but I, I use this all the time yeah. because I do think it's a key. I think mm -hmm. strong um, hip extensors are really critical for people with hip pain. And have you found an ideal ratio between flexion and extension? So in some of the work that we've done, um, testing the hip flexion strength in mm -hmm. sitting versus hip extension strength this way, it, it, it's pretty close to one to one. Right. Yeah. yeah it's a good goal. Um, and with, again, just sort of talking ballpark numbers, unpublished, but mm -hmm. what we tend to see is that I have a goal that I want people to be around 300 newtons or more with this test okay. um, when they're, you know, to be confident that they're, they've got good strength. Yeah, great. Um, Often what you'll see at that first presentation is they might be quite good at hip flexion, but the mm -hmm. hip extensors are way, way, way yeah. weaker. Yeah. So, And I guess then that carries over into when you're assessing their gait, you can see they're not going into that hip extension. Yeah. So maybe it's the lack of strength posteriorly that's an issue. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, rotation strength is one that if I have a lot of time, I do measure, mm -hmm. but I don't measure actually measure it on everybody. But I don't know about yeah. you, so whether you I just use don't it much. know that it tells us much. I think you can cheat with a whole lot of different ex. Like, what are we actually really assessing? And I don't know that. Um, you know, I think you can use lots of different muscles to do this. Yeah. yeah. And if you think about the types of muscles that we're strengthening, most of them have either a flexion or extension moment arm. Yeah, absolutely. So you're going to perhaps capture those muscles yeah. function better in their hip flexion and possibly extension yeah. strength and rotation strength. I think sometimes too that testing rotation strength can be a little bit provocative for pain as well. Yeah. So you just have to be careful there.